Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. I'm Matthew Raphael Johnson, and um, today, um, and this is this is by request, although this is something I should have done a long time ago. Uh, we're going to deal with the Black Hundreds, or the Union of the Russian People. I've um, I've dealt with them uh, both directly and indirectly in, in writing in on this show. Especially uh, my paper on the myth of the of the pogroms, uh, these mythical events um, in um, turn of the century uh, Ukraine and uh, parts of Belarus, and I, I've been over those uh, those concepts in detail and how how absurd the stories are, but they center around um, the Bolshevik as well as the liberal and Western and American premise in history that the Union of the Russian People. Was a, um, a violent organization that had no other purpose than to torment uh, Jews, who of course were completely innocent, and um, and uh, and therefore had every right to revolt against the Goyim in the Bolshevik Revolution, even though it wasn't really a Jewish revolution. That's a bit convoluted, but that's pretty much what um, historians in in, the, in, in the universities are saying about it. As always, uh, what you hear in university classrooms is false. Um, not only the, the facts, but the logic that you use to present the facts is completely false. And there's almost nothing stated by these people, uh, mainstream history textbooks on, on this extremely important era, that's true. Um, there's very, very few eras in human history more significant than the period of time roughly from 1900 to 1918 in Russia, the creation of the Soviet Union, um, that no one denies, is one of the most significant uh, globally historic events of all time. And it changed the world completely. Nothing in the 20th century, none of these, these the destruction, the warfare, all of this would not have occurred had the uh, Russians all remained in power. Um, and because the, the system uh, in academia is in, in a strange position. For the most part, they're not interested in defending Bolshevism. They will. Uh, and so they've created this myth that Stalin is the bad one, and therefore um, the Jews uh, preceding him were the good ones, because Jews can do no wrong. Lenin and, and Trotsky um, uh, are innocent. And so they created this myth that Stalin was this, this, um, this Hitler in, in Moscow, to make it okay to hate that particular era in, in the Soviet Union. So they were able to make it palatable for the left uh, to hate the USSR. Lenin was good, Trotsky of course was good, and Stalin was bad. And of course we know the truth is, is that they were identical. All three of those men were identical in every single respect. In ideology, in their purpose, in their policy, even in their personalities. They differed in no substantial, even insubstantial respect. Um, of the three of them, Bernstein or Trotsky was probably the most vicious, and in his own writings, as I've proven elsewhere, is completely anti uh, or non-Marxist. He strictly was a Jewish nationalist, and really was was driven by this hatred to destroy the Goyim. Um, I've quoted him all over the place, making very non-Marxist statements, proving, and plus the fact that he died a, a multi-billionaire, uh, prove that the entire USSR and the, the, the communist uh, ideology there was a fraud. Uh, but none of this would even be relevant had um, Tsar Nicholas II um, been able to maintain power and uh, hopefully had, had World War I um, never occurred. The Black Hundreds, the Union of the Russian People, um, you know, the Black Hundreds, by the way, it, the, the term is not a problem. Black uh, means, means a lot of positive things in, in, uh, in Orthodox thinking. Number one, it's, it's the... Um, it's a divine darkness. It's that you know the fact that God the Father is unknowable in his in his essence. So we see him as this, as this abyss in, in, in the good sense. It also refers to uh, the peasantry. Uh, it refers to um, you know the black peasants, meaning these people who um, were were dirty from from the soil, but that soil was was nourishing in every respect. And black also works for the black clergy, that is the monastics. So the Black Hundreds were very well, and Hundreds is a, is a medieval 
uh, organization of, of local politics um, in in Russian cities. It was a, a section of a street, uh, a guild, so to speak, a section of a street that was dedicated to a particular uh, crowd. Not always, but that was uh, especially in Novgorod how it was how it was organized. Uh, I began reading um, about the Black Hundreds. I mean, you have to you have to know Russian because nothing in English is worth one. And I read um, uh, Vadim Kozhin's uh, 1998 work on the topic, and of course, um, I was able to read uh, these men in, in the original. What happens is normally that, that um, academics and journalists will read this stuff and tell you what you're supposed to take from it. This is happening more and more, especially in, in American politics, where um, you know, Donald Trump will make a statement and uh, you won't generally be permitted to hear it, or read it, uh, they will give you a very unflattering summary of it. So people are, are walking around uh, in a dream world, having absolutely no idea what's being said and what's being done, and they're, they're coming out of the universities more ignorant than ever. Uh, coming out, you know, if, you, if you go to the university, and get a history degree, and do what you're told. You, know, you believe the stuff that you're writing down, and you are an absolute ignoramus. You're an ignoramus uh, without critical thought, and knowing very, very few actual usable facts about history. Uh, and, and Russian history, because it's so globally significant, cosmically significant, that that's where the, the lying and the mythology will reach absolutely epic proportions. And, and, and thanks to Johnson's Law, there are very few people who know how to refute it. There are very few people who know um, uh, the language well enough to be able to read it and actually to get into this uh, the actual real history uh, written by people at the time. And really the worst thing that's happening now is that the, the Orthodox Church has now condemned some of its great saints uh, for supporting this. Uh, the American Orthodox Church, even among the traditionalists, is uh, an absolute disaster. They are frightened to death of being called a nationalist or, or, or anti-Semite. And they will repudiate their saints. They'll repudiate synod after synod in order to protect their, their reputation. So these people are, are not, um, not helpful. I, I, I've explained to people at length um, how the, the Russian Orthodox Church saw Hitler as this, as this uh, harbinger of, of social justice. I could give them quote after quote after quote. The next day I'll hear them talking about it and they'll say that, oh, they just, they just wanted the defeat of Stalin, they didn't care about Hitler. I had just explained to them, and yet they've blocked it out somehow. That's the brainwashing and dishonesty. But the Orthodox Church in America is, is, is useless in this respect. And uh, often they won't even talk about it. Uh, and yet almost the entire uh, Orthodox hierarchy at the time supported them, uh, at least those uh, in the western part of, of the country. There were plenty who did not, though. Uh, but those who did were very important, especially St. Tikhon and John of Kronstadt. Um, the Union of the Russian People was the largest political party, political movement, I should say movement rather than party, um, in the 1905-1906 revolutionary era. They dwarfed uh, every, other, every other political group. The Cadet Party was being financed from abroad. The Cadet Party was, you know, had um, uh, thousands coming in from, from England and America, uh, from Jewish bankers, and yet never, never went over 40,000. It's really strange how they were able to sweep the Duma elections uh, and having so few members. Well, the fact of the matter is uh, that uh, usually royalist presses were under attack from the government, strangely enough. Um, they were seen as anti-state, uh, and uh, they, were, they were regularly under attack. They were constantly being hauled into court uh, for a defamation suit, which is how the liberal nobility was able to shut down the Royalist Press, and actually, it's a um, uh, hundred years ago this month, February of uh, 1917. The Duma uh, demanded that all monarchist and Orthodox publications in the country be shut down. In 1917, which also was kept out of the um, uh, of the history books, but um, the Union of the Russian People had almost a million members. Uh, by the time the, the time World War One broke out, uh, they were regularly under attack uh, from the government, 
uh, local politicians, uh, them officials, especially Duma officials and bureaucrats, despise them. And the Union of the Russian People was at war with the bureaucracy in Petersburg and elsewhere. A big uh, a code I want to keep in mind here is that the left, the liberals, I should say, in, in, in old Russia viewed government as ruling through a bureaucracy, a secretive uh, professional group of people dedicated to the liberal agenda who will continue to promote that agenda regardless of what politicians or, or, or the crown may say. It became an independent interest group and hence had no legitimacy because there was no loyalty to that bureaucracy. No one elected them. Uh, there was no religious sanction around them. Uh, the right Union of the Russian people uh, stressed the idea of class. Now, when I say class, as I've said many times, I'm referring to um, someone's function in society. I'm not referring to income. Only in the vulgar Western world does class mean income. It refers to one station. And what we're really talking about is, is guilt or guilds. Um, each one with its own particular function. It could be, uh, it could be you know, the monastics, it could be um, educators, it could be law enforcement, it could be manufacturing, uh, it could be banking, whatever it is, uh, of course, agriculture, um, and uh, each one having its own internal standards uh, as to how it's to function. And here you have you know, the carrying out of social, um, social, socially necessary actions without any professional bureaucracy connected to the state. That was a threat to the left, because the left, wherever it's gone, and whatever it's done, has demanded utter ideological uniformity, and has always come to power using force and violence, and will keep it using force and violence. So they demanded a complete, centralized, totally uniform bureaucracy uh, that would smash down opposition to it, as you saw in the French Revolution. And even under Kerensky. Um, on the other hand, the Union of the Russian People and the uh, Orthodox tradition, the traditional uh, world in general, even you know, outside of Russia, um, saw these functions better done according to a decentralized system of class relationships. But anyway, according to um, Anatoly Stepanov, um, Social Democrats were, were hovering around uh, 20,000 members, uh, uh, usually non Russians. Um, alienated uh, urban uh, types, former nobles, uh, with tons of funding from abroad. Uh, the cadet party, 40, 50,000. And yet somehow this divided uh, liberal group uh, swept three Duma elections. That, of course, doesn't make any sense. Union of the Russian people had, depending on who you read, I mean, a million is, is the high estimate, low estimate is between five and 600,000. Uh, and they are the only ones who did not receive subsidies uh, from abroad or from anybody else for that matter. Now, and for the most part, um, about 70% of its membership came from the peasantry. You also had um, uh, a tremendous uh, representation from the crafts and the professions uh, in the cities, uh, landlords uh, largely being, you know, passe, since most uh, land was in peasant hands. The church was not allowed to own land, so Russia was in a very different position in that respect which puts a very uh, different spin on when the, the cadet party would demand the complete nationalization of all land and the dispossession of the landlords. They're actually referring to the commune in that respect. But even, even Bulgakov talks about the electoral fraud in every Duma election. And um, there's, there's the ways that, that these tiny groups with foreign funding were able to sweep these elections. That there were several, several things. Uh, one way was the liberal Zemstva movement was able to control the local politics and local polling stations. Number two, the press, which, as always, was in Jewish hands and absolutely irresponsible, criminally irresponsible. They made up stories about right-wingers. They made up stories about, the, about Rasputin. Uh, no interest in fact-checking or anything else. Uh, it was a pure yellow journalism. And they would promote uh, local liberal candidates and say whatever they needed to say about them to make them popular for the, for the local population. So they simply lied. Um, and the other way is that uh, candidates themselves would simply lie. Um, remember, political parties back then really didn't exist. Oftentimes, dumb professors will, will you know, try to talk about these parties, like these social democrats and the cadets, like, like these were you know, Republicans and Democrats. 
They weren't. These are largely the creation of, of the press at the time. Uh, like in, in uh, Eastern Europe today, a lot of these parties are the results of a powerful foreign interests centering around a, um, uh, a charismatic leader uh, with a lot of money or possibly a puppet, uh, sort of like the, um, uh, the Coke dealers in, in Colombia deciding to become communists so as to give some um, legitimacy and moral stature to their, to their um, uh, profits. Uh, which, of course, is regular day. The communist movement in, in Latin America was, was funded by, by drugs. Um, and so this is how the, the elections were completely rigged and how you had a totally unrepresentative um, uh, a Duma or a parliament. And you had people pretending to be peasants. They're dressed up in, in what they think was, was usually very out-of-date uh, peasant costume. They've never seen a field before. Um, you know, Jews or, or you know, from the cities dressing up in peasant costume, and the press would, would approach the peasantry and say, this, this, these are the people you need to vote for. Uh, and, of course, they were seen as populist and, and progressive, and, and they, would be, they would win. And, of course, these parties, you know, they, they would simply misrepresent uh, whatever they thought. And, and candidates were not doing stump speeches. It wasn't like they were, you know, on the campaign trail. Um, the press simply told the people what they needed to hear about them, and then the candidate was simply chosen. And, uh, and sent to represent that, that powerful faction. That's really all it really was. So uh, even Bulgakov talks about the, the violence of the left, the polling stations. Remember, in this period of time, um, left-wing terrorists were killing, uh, all in total, you know, maybe 50,000 Russians. And a low-level civil war had been going on since uh, the murder of Alexander II. Uh, most of their demands had been met um, decades earlier, proving that they were liars. They were largely funded from abroad, and as uh, Tikhomirov said, who was a former member of Land and Liberty, it was, they were, these were totally uh, Yiddish-speaking uh, Jewish movements. Now, Land and Liberty killed Alexander II primarily because he was taking all their issues away. They needed people miserable so they can manipulate them better. So everything you know about this era is, is completely wrong. The press um, made up whatever story they needed to promote the liberal and Jewish agenda at the time. Uh, Oleg Platonov has a list of all of the major newspapers at the time and their ownership. Uh, so it's easy enough to go and, and, and list all the names and you'll see the Jewish names attached to every major paper. And despite all of this, the Royalist press, um, although harassed, uh, often uh, uh, very poor, uh, put out of business on a regular basis, they had no funding for, uh, locally or, or from abroad, uh, still maintained far larger uh, uh, organizational structures. And they came into existence to protect, protect the Orthodox Church from um, Jewish and, and liberal terrorists. As I've said elsewhere, as I've written, um, the, um, the heavily Jewish cities in the West, you know, Mogilev and, and Odessa, uh, Jews were extremely well armed. They, were, they easily outgunned the police. Uh, you know, police and bureaucracy in the local level was, was you know, very minimal. Uh, the Jews were heavily armed. There's no gun control. Uh, the, the government didn't have that kind of power in Tsarist Russia. So the Jews often had heavy weaponry in Kiev and uh, Kinesia and pl places like this, in Odessa especially. You had communist and, and liberal militias, exclusively Jewish. And the Black Hundreds um, grew primarily in these areas. Uh, they were urban. Uh, and, and Western, and therefore it's pretty clear that they came into existence to defend uh, Gentiles against uh, Jewish violence. Um, the Jewish militias in all of these uh, Western, especially in Ukraine and even Poland, these cities um, were extremely well armed, extremely well organized, and financed from abroad. They had all the money they needed, and they could outgun any local organization. The Black Hundreds came into existence because the local police were useless. Uh, and in many cases, like the mayor of Odessa, sided with, with, with the Reds and created a, a People's Republic. Um, I've, I've written that elsewhere, too, and I have all the information on that if you, if you want to see it. So the, um, the Union of the Russian People uh, was really founded by Alexander Dubrovin. Um, and early he was, the, he was the guiding light of it. Uh, Pushkevich created the, the much later and, and I think fraudulent uh, Union of the Archangel Michael. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. 
the program and the policy of the Black Hundreds is, um, is fairly simple. And the idea was to unify as many of the different uh, uh, royalist uh, factions as humanly possible. Um, they completely rejected, as we said, the concept of bureaucracy. This was a liberal creation. This is a modern creation. Bureaucracy uh, is connected only with the modern idea of the state. This is how liberals uh, were to rule. Um, they did believe in, in freedom of, of religion. Russia is an orthodox place, but like most, as most official religions, um, other uh, confessions were not were not harmed in any way. Unlike in liberal societies, where atheism is, is official and other religions are are uh, Christianity anyway, is uh, it regularly under attack. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church needed to be radically reformed and made independent. And one of the ways to do this is to resurrect the patriarch and to destroy the synodal system. There's every saint, every monastic of the Russian Orthodox Church in the 19th and early 20th century rejected Peter the Great and his Masonic um, uh, synodal system. And the union of the Russian people was, um, uh, was extremely important in this respect and was best organized in terms of fighting for the restoration of the church to its rightful place in society. Um, because of the left's obsession with bureaucracy, um, the Black Hundreds wanted the establishment of The Black Hundreds actually saw themselves as a conduit between the crown on the one hand and the people on the other. The people being the peasants and lower level workers, the overwhelming majority of the population. Um, which were not represented in Zemstvism, not represented in the uh, uh, in the Duma at all, and certainly not in the cities. Um, Tsar Nicholas II, you know, said he essentially gave up and said, you know, I, I can't fight this noble bureaucracy, this Petrine Masonic uh, cult that runs everything now. The, the bureaucracy was liberal, the bureaucracy was Masonic. Um, that's easy enough to demonstrate. And so he said, I am approaching the people directly. The union of the Russian people was a response to this. We are answering the call, and therefore the battle against the bureaucracy, uh, the tool of, of liberalism at the time, and certainly later the tool of Bolshevism, um, was essential to its, uh, to its idea. And to purge this administration at all levels, Zemstvo especially, uh, the county government, as well as in St. Petersburg and in the major cities, was an extremely important, very popular uh, part of their program. The direct link with the people was very, very important. Uh, economically, this is where they really were, were um, extremely significant. The left simply lied about its agenda. They never said we demand the total nationalization of land and the creation of this mega state. Uh, if they said that, no one, would, no one would buy it. So whatever those platforms were, assuming that they were taken seriously in the first place, were lies. They were never put into practice, never, you know, there was no desire to put them into practice. They simply lied about it. On the other hand, the Union of the Russian people were the only ones who had a, a rational and populist program. Uh, one plank of it, and I'm not sure about this one, but is the rejection of the gold standard and putting of Russia on a fiat currency controlled entirely by the crown. The gold standard, you know, Russia went back and forth on that issue. Um, I'm not entirely uh, certain one way or the other, but the Black Hundreds were convinced that gold was something that um, international uh, Jewry and liberalism was in, in control of. And they wanted Russian uh, bonds, Russian investors to be as separate as humanly possible from global economic forces. Russia could be completely self-sufficient. Very few countries in the world that could claim that. Russia, the Russian Empire, was one of them. They really didn't need anybody else. There's no reason... Uh, except in very specific circumstances, why they should be involved in international um, currency trading or, or really international trade at all, except in grain and possibly in oil. Uh, they had a huge trade surplus, and um, but for the most part, they really didn't need anybody. Uh, Europe needed them, though, because Russia was feeding Europe with, with grain uh, and sugar from Ukraine. So um, getting away from gold was a way of saying um, we don't want to be a part of any commodity market, which, of course, gold is, is a part of it. They demanded a state bank where all government functions were to take place. Uh, however, at the local level, both private and public sources of funding, creating uh, zero interest, 
um, loans for, for peasants and uh, for townsmen at the lower level as well. And this is something that had been done under Alexander III. This has been part of the Russian tradition for some time. Uh, but these wanted more money. They wanted a, a streamlined system. They wanted a less bureaucratic approach. And they wanted this currency that, you know, what, Russia was an extremely wealthy place with um, high incomes, especially when you consider the low cost of living. Russians live better than Europeans do. They had lower taxes. They had better access to, to services. And they were more self-sufficient as a nation. And they had, their, they had no debt. Their public debt may have just been uh, financing uh, investment credits, but that was easily taken care of with, with sales of, uh, of, uh, of grain and, and oil later on, especially sugar. Uh, they also wanted, um, and they wanted to get this, this guild system, the development of the strengthening of the mirror, the, this, the strengthening of the artel or the, or the label, uh, the labor commune uh, in the cities, in parts of the countryside. This was absolutely essential. And this wasn't really revolutionary, but Russia had been doing this for some time. The Union of the Russian People was saying it's time for a true populist royalist state to begin backing these uh, formerly private and at one time monastic um, institutions. You know, the West is using its tremendous productive capacity to create this oligarchy and to feed the war machine. Uh, Russia is wealthy enough and large enough where it can have a strong military but at the same time uh, use this excess, um, this the surplus production and the tremendous wealth that Russia is creating in her, you know, she had double-digit growth figures in agriculture and industry every year. So money was not an issue, as it was in, in the West. And Black Hundreds were the only ones that had a solid, usable, and, and practical program to actually use that wealth um, to increase the, the betterment of, of the peasantry. Uh, the left simply had no program or refused to talk about it or said the stupid things like, we're going to take money away from the landlord, or take land from the landlord. Except the landlords were the peasants, and the landlords were the were the um, were the commune. So when the Duma said this, they meant land is going to go to the state or to the oligarchy. So everything is completely backwards and inverted uh, from what your professors had said. And uh, given the fact that 97% of all farmland was in the hands of the peasants, when the Duma got up there and said we're going to nationalize all land and take it from the landlords, um, we know what they meant. And it's not surprising since it happened uh, after the French Revolution as well. The Bolsheviks uh, promised peace, land, and bread. Well, peace was ridiculous because they need constant warfare, as Trotsky said, and constant violence to justify the state and the repressive apparatus. Land, they didn't even believe in because all land was nationalized. So that was a blatant lie. And bread, well, they didn't produce much of it. Uh, they produced much lower qualities of it compared to what you know Russia had fed the world before this. And what little they made only went to people who were loyal to the system. So never before was a more ridiculous lying uh, slogan ever put forth than peace, land, and bread. And to this day, you have people who actually believe that they meant this, despite the fact that when they came to power, they did the exact opposite. So somehow in their minds, they could bracket reality from their, their uh, brainwashed uh, knee-jerk reactions to things. People's Bank and the Peasant Bank have been around um, uh, under Alexander III, it even actually has it has antecedents in the monastic world under, under um, uh, Joseph of Villoc and even uh, Ivan the Terrible. There were um, uh, versions of this in the past. Again, this is something that public money, private money, uh, needs to go in and to reestablish and to reestablish the church as a social organization. They were not permitted to own land; they were put on state salaries. And the monasteries, of course, were um, uh, you know, a shadow of their former selves and generally were, were non-property only or very little. And uh, they, had to, they couldn't own land as monasteries because the, the synodal system uh, wouldn't permit it. All church income went directly to the synod, even the sale of candles, everything uh, went directly to the synod. And then each parish or monastery was put on a very small state salary. Uh, the Black Hundreds wanted to and would have. Uh, completely reverse this, and this is why they had so substantial support. John of Kronstadt being the main one who uh, regularly made speeches throughout Russia, supporting them, uh, and Saint Tikhon uh, very much so. Uh, so Russian Orthodox people, you have to make a choice: either you reject John of Kronstadt or accept the Black Hundreds and what they believe in. You can't do both. 
and you can't be honest. You can't be um, uh, you can't be an honest person and try to hold both. John of Kronstadt condemned Jewish control of the press and Jewish control of the merchant classes throughout his life, while living a saintly life, clearly uh, through grace and performing miracles and everything else. You can't have it both ways. You can't venerate the man, but then reject everything he said or sanitize everything he said. Uh, that's a lie. Either you reject it or you reject, you know, later on, you reject um, what Tikhon said about them, you reject what Anastasia said about them. you reject them, you leave orthodoxy entirely, or you come to, to uh, accept what they believe and try to understand why they said these things. And they had a lot access to far more information than you do. Jews were going to behave abominably in uh, Russian life uh, over the next uh, several decades. The press was the enemy, as it always is. The press made up whatever story they wanted. They weren't a news organization. Very much like uh, CNN uh, is today, it's simply a propaganda arm for the left. They have no interest in, in reporting. That's, that's gone. That's passé. Uh, then and now, it's just yellow journalism. If they say the sky is blue, it's probably not. I mean, you can't believe anything they say. Somehow, uh, by an act of God, the sky must be purple. And that's how bad it is. That's how bad it was then. The press was the enemy. And the press was the way that these uh, highly well-connected uh, millionaire Jewish um, uh, oligarchs were controlling uh, popular discourse at the time. They believed in Zionism. And this was very common uh, throughout uh, nationalist parties in Europe uh, because Zionism in and of itself, you know, if, if, if all people have a right to self-determination, well, so do they. So do Jews. In and of itself, it cannot be condemned. Now, it certainly can't be uh, the creation of American money and, and, and be uh, constantly at the umbilical cord of the American taxpayer, dragging America into wars and everything else. That's outrageous. But if indeed every group um, has a right to self-determination, so, uh, so do Jews. That happens to be the case. The Black Hundreds accepted that. Uh, Codriano in, in Romania accepted that. Adolf Hitler accepted that. They all did. All major nationalist and national socialist parties from 1900 to the end of World War II believed in some form of Zionism. This is a way where Jews can uh, be removed from Europe. They can no longer be parasites. They can actually go to a country of their own and work the land and live honest, decent lives. And this was a position of almost all uh, national socialist and Christian socialist parties uh, throughout Europe right up until uh, World War II. Um, they believed firmly in the eight-hour day. They were the only political group that actually uh, had this as part of its agenda and actually meant it. The Bolsheviks rejected it the minute they took power. Uh, no bourgeois party accepted the eight-hour day, even they may have said it. Like everything else, they simply were making it up. Uh, capitalists were working um, at labor in 12, 16-hour days, as they were in England and France. And only Russia and Germany, royal societies, authoritarian societies, at least at the upper levels, had uh, that strong labor legislation. Um, President William Taft said to the Russian ambassador that your emperor has created almost a perfect system of labor legislation for Russian factories. Um, it was at the time, you know, common knowledge in the West, but of course the Russian press kept it from uh, the Russian population. In England, workers were being worked to death in the factories. Only Russia and Germany had uh, any kind of even a rudimentary labor legislation. The Black Hundreds were demanding uh, it go further than that. And this is why factory owners violently opposed the Black Hundreds. And the Black Hundreds did engage in acts of violence against factory owners that were tormenting and torturing workers. Um, and like so many in the nationalist movement in Russia, the parish, the parish church, the monastery, as an extension of the family, was the basic unit of society. Remember, a parish wasn't just established and people you know, from different parts of the region came to it. That's what you have in America. That's, that's not what it was. A village existed. They had a tremendous uh, local history and tradition. 
everyone knew everything about each other. There were common law uh, traditions for almost every little thing. The law was accepted by all and known by all. You couldn't you couldn't put anything past anybody. You know, merchants and, and snake oil salesmen were, were, were kicked out immediately. They, they could easily be identified. That's where the parish came from. And then as they built a, a Christian population, the parish became simply an extension of all of the uh, communes in the area. And they got together and they, they were able to uh, finance it. The priest usually was elected up until Peter the Great and was usually a monastery for the more advanced uh, ascetics in the area. It was not anything separate from the village or from the commune. It was just an extension of it. But today, in most places, this is foreign thing. You know, uh, pre priests are brought in from elsewhere. Uh, it has no real roots in the area. Now, in America, you have your know, Serbian and, and Ukrainian churches that are a part of the ethnic development of uh, places you know, like Pittsburgh and, and Cleveland. That's quite legitimate. And, and, and uh, um, honorable, of course, they're disappearing. But the real rural Paris was an extension of the commune and was not separate from it in, in any real way. It simply took the day-to-day -day life of the population and then gave it the Christian spirit. It was not opposed to it, and it was part of this common law tradition. It, it regularized and elevated the common law, the traditions of the population, eliminating a handful of things that, that were contradictory to the faith, but in general, following natural law. And the parish took care of a tremendous amount of um, issues in terms of education and employment. Uh, by 1900, remember the, the labor literacy, I say 1910, uh, urban workers were literate uh, by about 90%, and the peasants about 70-75%. Uh, I might note that uh, Vadim Kojin, the historian of the Black Hundreds, says there's really three groups of people who um, were to blame for the overthrow of, of Nicholas, the, the battle against the Black Hundreds. And that was the upper levels of, of labor. These are urbanites who um, um, had reached a substantial level of income. They'd be like our suburbanites today uh, in America. Um, who didn't even see themselves as part of the village anymore. They didn't even see themselves as labor anymore. They saw themselves as, as co-creators with capital. The capitalists themselves, the factory owners, um, almost to a man, were at war with traditional society, with the commune, with Tsar Nicholas and the Black Hundreds, and the intellectuals, uh, Jewish, finance from abroad, but plenty of Gentiles as well. This was the, and of course the Jewish, you know, the one group that, that doesn't mention, of course, is Jews, but that they would be found in, in the uh, uh, press and the uh, intellectuals. The press was considered part of the intelligentsia anyway. Um, and this is extremely important to know that that's the coalition. And the Black Hundreds were the first to really identify them. And this really, these groups alone were the only uh, groups that were represented in the Duma. Uh, like Electoral fraud, both directly and indirectly, was the order of the day, uh, especially in the first uh, two or three uh, Duma. And eventually, as our Nicholas word, it was the end, a ridiculous uh, experiment in, in Jacobin politics. And finally, one of their central economic uh, platform uh, planks was um, free land for peasants. Russia has land, uh, it has more land that it can use. Peasants should be given its land for free. Um, peasants don't need the black uh, soil regions of Ukraine to, to make a profit. They did it in northern Russia, they did it in Siberia, they could do it anywhere. Uh, land should be free. Uh, especially in a place like Russia, where they had uh, so much of it. I want to mention the union of Archangel Michael. Um, this was created as a schism from the Black Hundreds uh, by, the, by the beginning of 1908. Um, Prashkevich, uh, the man who masterminded the murder of Rasputin, had split from uh, Dubrovin and the rest of, of the Black Hundreds, uh, partially because he was an Anglophile. He... Um, uh, he was receiving support from Great Britain and slowly but surely pulled away from the royalist um, point of view. Uh, Dubrovin also, uh, in, in opposition to Prushkevich, uh, completely rejected a Stolipin, or I should say, yes, the Stolipin and Vita and their liberal uh, reforms um, in, in Russia, in creating this, you know, creating the, 
the beginnings of a of a um, labor aristocracy, and uh, almost a kind of a what we would call today a yuppie a yuppie uh, overclass. Uh, Rasputin also a big issue. Uh, Pushkevich uh, saw started accepting the press reports that he was this monster. None of it was ever true. Um, none of it was ever demonstrated. But because going after Tsar Nicholas was a very bad idea in Russia at the time, he was very popular. The way to do it was to go after Rasputin and make up a story that he was this lech who was just, you know, always at the palace and had control over the family. Well, he was almost never there. He was a very minor uh, player there. And his only real function was when uh, um, the, the crown prince was, was ill, he was able to, to help him. And that was it. Otherwise, he wasn't there. He didn't want to be there. Um, slowly but surely, Pushkevich, in creating the union of Saint, uh, the Archangel Michael, um, began demanding uh, in the murder. It's important to note that the killing of Rasputin, that was the first shot in the Russian Revolution. And that's what uh, Dubrovin and, and, and many, many members of the, of the Black Hundreds said at the time. That uh, Rasputin was a symbol. He was a symbol for the commune, a symbol for the peasantry, a symbol for the monastics. Rasputin was not a lecherous individual. Uh, that's all mythology. And I have all the material and citations and evidence on my site, and, and uh, I've talked about it on this show as well. But it wasn't really about Rasputin. Once Rasputin was gone, the next target would be um, the Empress. And he began spreading the myth, along with the Jewish press, that the Empress was his German spy, which was absurd. And again, slander. And then with the Empress gone, Nicholas II would be next, and one of the crown princes would be put in, in his place. And that was the, that was the plan. And in the murder of, of um, Rasputin, Prischewitz was to create a, a pro-English, uh, Jacobin, you know, Stolipanite monarchy. Uh, and essentially a constitutional monarchy like, like in Great Britain, and with a bank uh, under the London oligarchs. When the um, the Legion or the Union of the Archangel Michael was forming, as is often the case, they have to make up a story. And the schism in a group like that. I mean, it was it was really to destroy the nationalist and royalist movement, and they knew this. And this would give uh, some lessons for today. That those who are without really substantial cause, creating divisions and bad-mouthing uh, nationalist people need to be silenced by any means necessary. They're doing damage. They're often very ignorant. Um, we don't have to agree with everybody. We can get along with everybody without agreeing with everything they say. We change our minds on things all the time. So we don't agree with ourselves. We don't bad-mouth each other unless there's a severe moral problem. Otherwise, we leave them alone. None of us are perfect. If our private life were, were, were trumpeted publicly like theirs is, we wouldn't look so good either. Leave them alone. You don't have to agree with everything. Right? Some of these uh, right-wingers, they believe in evolution. Some of them uh, have a tendency towards, towards weirdo paganism and materialism. Um, uh, they, they, um, they have this they're very weird, illiterate love affair with Nietzsche. You know, they read you know, a few syllables here and there. I think they know them, um, but that's okay. They do a lot of other good things. You don't have to accept everything they do. You don't have to like somebody to respect them. When you have people attacking one another, I, I did, he believes in evolution, therefore he's evil, and he's working for uh, 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 demons, then that person is mentally unstable. Then uh, that person is doing damage. This is what happened here, and usually there's another agenda. Prescavich created this concept that that well, they're not reporting their finances openly, which, as you know, could never be. Who cares? That's never a reason to create this public scandal. That's never really the issue. You see, when John Maximo, St. John Maximovich was dragged through the courts, these financial things were never the issue. No one's going to go through all that hell for the sake of, of, of transparent reporting. When you hear these technical issues like that, you hear these debates among Orthodox people, and they're quoting these canons, uh, you know, in, in these technical ways. It's never about that. No one creates schisms for these technical issues, ever. No one creates scandals for them. There's a deeper 
more substantial, usually a personal issue underneath. Um, and in, you know, in, in uh, San Francisco, it was really about uh, the nature of the white, well, really the nature of the black hundreds and, and the political uh, agenda of the Russian immigration. That was really at the at the at the core of what happened to John Maximov. Um, the schisms in the Orthodox Church, especially the true Orthodox Church, they're almost they're never doctrinal. They're never moral. They're always personal, and it has some uh, you know personal ambition of some bishop or other. But they have to invent a reason, often a very weird technical reason that no one would ever really you know worry about. If that's the case, you know it's not true. Anytime a group of bishops splits off from another group, if it is not directly doctrinal or moral, now the moral can't you were all immoral, but moral in the case of being legal, that we could really destroy the church if this continues. If it's not that, if it's not those two things, then you can't leave. Anyone who does is putting their soul in danger. No, it doesn't put the people in danger. Um, bishops aren't aren't leaders of the church. They're not they're not the this, these archetypes where all the people are collected into. Uh, that's ridiculous. You know, they're often deeply flawed, uh, power hungry people who cause more more harm than good. Um, they're elected by the people and they're subject to the people in the monastics. Uh, bishops don't lead at anything. Uh, maybe maybe spiritual elders do. But certainly bishops don't. The most you could hope for a bishop is that maybe on occasion they could they could have some regularity in, in finances and and where priests are supposed to go and, and how they're educated. Usually they fail at that. Uh, but that's the most. That's all. That's all they are. Um, spiritual fathers and, and lay saints. I mean, this is that's where the leadership. That's where the sanctity is. Uh, there's nothing special about the bishop's office in that regard. Um, so it's never you know it's never that issue. In this case, it was money from Great Britain. It was a rejection of Tsar Nicholas. Uh, Pushkevich began rejecting Tsar Nicholas, saying that there was no systematic program, that there was no um, no real leadership. He bought into the myths of the Jewish press um, that he was um, um, uh, that he was a weak-minded and that, that the bureaucracy was ruling uh, rather than the crown. Uh, none of this is true. And he didn't mention this in public. What he did say in public was that the Union of the Russian People um, is not properly reporting their finances. And they would throw these, these uh, rumors into the press that there was some terrible uh, moral thing going on here. We have to create a new organization. Uh, Dubrovin, of course, uh, saw through it all. No one's perfect. He wasn't, certainly. Even John Maximovich wasn't. No one is. That's certainly no reason to split off from them. And when the uh, Legion of the Archangel Michael was formed in Russia, uh, it did tremendous damage and broke the, the huge, um, almost monolithic power that the, that, the, uh, that the Black Hundreds had in many cities of Western Russia. So Pushkevich uh, was one of the people who greased the skids for the revolution. Uh, Pushkevich, in creating this schism um, for no good reason, uh, broke the, the tremendous power. I mean, the Black Hundreds had had you know a million members. It had publications. It had that they had their own churches, they had their own monasteries, they had their own organizations. If they had a, a state within a state, how this organization would con continue to to grow and to thrive, there could have been no Russian Revolution. Pushkevich uh, needed to end this, and in in breaking up uh, the the Black Hundreds, and then killing Rasputin, then going after the royal family, creating this palace coup, which is what he wanted. With British money, um, that's where the very beginnings of the of the Russian Revolution uh, starts, and I I'm, I believe that that is true. The killing of Rasputin was the first shot in the Russian Civil War and the first shot in the Russian uh, Revolution. Um, by the end of World War One, uh, Prushkevich became a Republican and rejected monarchy altogether. Um, Dubrovin. Uh, rejected completely the liberalization of the economy. Pushkevich uh, was a supporter of Vita in Stolipin. Uh, the province saw the commune and uh, as the um, means to maintain economic stability. The commune in the countryside and the labor artel in the cities and elsewhere. Uh, strong church, parish, family, monarchy. This is how Russia will uh, be rebuilt. Because these institutions were under attack everywhere. This is how 
uh, the society was going to be remade. Bush Gabbett is you know, slowly but surely becoming a Western liberal. And with British money, uh, he was an excellent organizer himself. At one point when he was a monarchist, he was a tremendous, uh, a very able organizer. Because of that, it seems that British money um, through the Masonic Lodges, where it usually found its conduits, uh, found a weak link. And there's always a weak link. But the Proven uh, was, was emphatic that breaking up the commune, breaking up the artel, creating this individualist ethos which could only benefit those who are already wealthy. If you create social chaos with individualism, uh, only the Jewish elite, who are extremely cohesive, will win. Those who are already wealthy and powerful now are invincible. With a group of, of communes and strong parishes and monasteries, it's different. These institutions uh, with ancient roots in, in society. Well, that's one of the things that Stolipin was doing was breaking up these roots. Well, the Union of the Russian people uh, were vehemently opposed to it. He knew what was happening. What the Bolsheviks were doing, um, what, what the, what the what, uh, Mensheviks were doing, uh, suddenly, revolution, the, the Vitten and his group were doing slowly, in the slow liberalization of the economy. It had the same end game. The destruction of the family, the destruction of um, the, the commune, the destruction of the crown, uh, and the creation of a, a local uh, oligarchy. Not connected to the church or, or the nobility, but foreigners, um, uh, Jews especially, and uh, Stolipin and Vita were, were very philo-Semitic in that respect. They did uh, support the monarchy, uh, but that was a temporary measure. They may have believed it naively that this is a way that the monarchy will be uh, buttressed, uh, that somehow the creation of this bourgeoisie, but this, this strong uh, uh, bourgeois order will support the monarchy. Uh, he apparently has never read a, a syllable of history in his life. But the creation of a bourgeois order is death to the monarchy. And he may well have been aware of that. But while he's engaging in this revolutionary uh, movement, um, Stolipin and Vita had to um, have this ability that the crown and the church offered. Uh, in fact, uh, Dubrovin was arrested because he was, at least for a brief period of time, suspected in the Stolipin's murder. Um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Vita's murder. And, um, and, you know, he, because his, his vehemence against the liberalization and destruction of the commune was so tremendous that he was, um, and in fact, the, the system, both the royal, uh, believe it or not, and the liberals were, were trying to find any excuse to get rid of the Um Libel suits were constant. The way that the, the you know, bourgeois elites in the cities had written libel law at the time, and this never occurred, this never applied to the Jewish press, ever. It only applied to the right-wing press. That you had to um, demonstrate the truth of each and every statement you made uh, when you talk about someone, or else you're finished. Now, you can never do that for the major Jewish presses in, in Moscow and in St. Petersburg. They made up stories about the royal family every single day. But because the remnants, the nobility and the bourgeoisie in the cities were overwhelmingly liberal and Menshevik were worse, only then did this ridiculous law uh, ever really uh, have teeth. And so this is how the royalist press uh, was destroyed. This is how um, the remnants, the nobility and the bourgeoisie were destroying um, the right wing movement. I'm sorry, I meant um, the murder of, of Stolipin. Sorry about that. Um, the way, you know, Dubrovin had the best, the Union of Russian people had the most realistic understanding of the Jewish issue. That wherever this group goes, it could be Russia in 1905 or America today, it's only occasionally in formal institutions that Jews were ruled. They rule through networks, of financial and intellectual power, informal networks, whether it be universities or whatever it is, um, that work together, come together on occasion, but generally function informally as a basically singular ideological unit, um, revealing themselves. Uh, you know, uh, elites, oligarchs need to rule by deceit. 
That's what oligarchy is. Uh, no one would accept the rule by the wealthy, so they have to manipulate the population. This goes back to the this goes back to to, to Nimrod. Um, this is a demonic element. Uh, the the fallen angels in 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 political life from the fall onward, deceit or the left. The left is always associated with deceit. It's a dagger hand versus a sword hand, which is the right. Um, oligarchy has to rule by lying. Uh, wealthy people who have no right to rule except through money have to, you know, they buy candidates, they buy the press. They can't admit that to anybody. No one would ever accept that. Um, the job, the intellectual job of the Union of the Russian People, according to uh, Dubrovin, was to expose these informal networks. What Stolipin was doing was empowering these networks. Stolipin only thought in terms of formal institutions. That's the bane of, of your very simple, simplistic thinking, that power can only be found in, in government. The deep state. Well, I, you know, I was referring to the regime as a far better explanation uh, uh, for a very long time. It's not the state. First of all, the state is mostly privatized. And second of all, the state's totally dependent on, on sources of capital, both local and, and foreign. It's private capital. That is is where the power is located. The state is, is, is a bodyguard for their, them at best. It's not a deep state. It's a regime. It's the same informal network of power. This is how oligarchy rules. There's some people who can't comprehend because you know, they're, they're simple-minded. They don't get it. They can't comprehend power unless it's an institution. They believe somehow that, that bishops are, are the pope of the diocese. So they think in very simple black and white terms. They don't understand that this is this is a, a vulgar, uh, um, you know, mechanistic, anomalistic way to think. Power, whether for good or for ill, operates in formal structures. Formal power is at most a very um, uh, just a just a you know temporary uh, abbreviation of these informal mechanisms for the sake of bringing some of it under public control. That's all it is, and it has it's nothing else than that. Power is always informal. Power always in the day-to-day the -day networks, the face-to-face -face, uh, dealings of, of people with, with authority or power. It could be money or, or whatever, religious sanction, whatever it is. Institutions are at, at best a, a tiny minor abbreviation, um, just, a, just a summary, so to speak, of where power is located. Institutions um, really play a, a minor role in the world institutions or window dressing. Politicians can come and go. That's not going to affect economic policy. It's not going to affect foreign policy. Politicians have very little power. They have little power in, in now the Russian Duma, they have very little power in America. The only hope for restoration from you know the rule of, of, of the prophets of King David to today is a strong monarch. Or someone like Vladimir Putin who is above uh, economic interest. Your authority is to be found, whether it be in the army or whether it be in security services or whether it be in the church, whether it be in, in, in the royal family, whatever it is, not oligarchs, not money, not that kind of power. Only then can you stand uh, against um, the money power, these informal, illegitimate informal uh, networks of banking and media power that use brainwashing techniques to manipulate people. Nothing has changed in, in 5,000 years. The Black Hundreds were a, a highly um, uh, influential and very sophisticated organization. Um, so many of the, the monastics and, and, and bishops and saints of the church at the time uh, saw the Black Hundreds as a form of deliverance. Pre-revolutionary Russian society was falling apart. There were murders uh, by the left with, with English money uh, on a daily basis, usually common people. There was a slaughter. Tens of thousands did the left murder with firm uh, support from the Duma and from the Jewish press. They had blood on their hands. And the you know, the Russian people was a way, that the Black Hundreds were a way to answer this, finally answer this. To heed the call, as our Nicholas saying, the Russian people themselves have to take action. The bureaucracy is, is hampering everything I do. I'm going to the people, going over their heads and appealing to you. 
the Black Hundreds were the answer. And this is why Pushkevich and the attempted palace coup, and then um, um, the split in the Black Hundreds was so absolutely necessary. Uh, and splits, whether it be in the church or in, or in legitimate political movements, are the bane and the death of these societies. And it was the same thing here, and it was indeed the first shot uh, of the Russian Revolution. The Black Hundreds, these are these are heroes. These were um, monastics. These were ascetics. These were saints. These were scholars against the the uh, alchemical bourgeois manipulators uh, of the banking cults that pretended to be liberal and had a Jacobin uh, bloodbath in store uh, for anyone who supports them. And that's the fact then, and that's the fact now. Thank you for listening, everybody, and I'll talk to you next time.